Hi, and welcome to Liscapism. When you go looking for historical sewing patterns, you'll find books like these. Inside, authors have reconstructed scaled-down pattern pieces from extant historical garments. Once you've scaled up okay, the gridded just pattern- stop. What? How do you know that scaling up is going to be the right choice for them? Well, it, it's too small on the page. This isn't a commercial pattern. What size is it going to be when it's scaled up? Do they know how to assemble it? You know what? Just go get stuff ready. We're going to clear some stuff up. Okay, folks, let's slow down a little bit. In this video, I'm not going to teach you how to scale up gridded patterns. Instead, I'm going to help you decide whether or not you should. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Patterns like the ones found in Patterns of Fashion, the cut of men's and women's clothes, and others are amazing. And like any tool, they serve a very specific purpose. So before you go enlarging these patterns willy-nilly, we're going to ask a few questions using this little flowchart. No, not this flowchart. This flowchart. Hopefully it will help you decide if you should even bother scaling up a gridded pattern. Spoiler alert, in most cases, scaling up is not going to be the way to go. These garments were usually custom made to fit an individual. You should do yourself the same kindness. So let's get going. What are you making? If you're looking for just any pattern from your period of interest or only want this pattern for reference, there's no point in scaling up the gridded pattern. Your method should be draping or Franken patterning. I'll explain those at the end. Or frankly, just finding another commercial pattern. If you're intending to create that exact garment or one that's very similar, by all means, proceed to the next question. Do you know how to assemble the garment? If yes, proceed to the next question. If no, well then let's figure it out. How to read the pattern notes. It's best to have a grip on garment making before attempting gridded patterns generally. The writers of these books assume that the readers will know how to fit a sleeve, finish a hem, insert a gore, etc. There are no clear steps, and a lot of the information you'd see on a commercial pattern is not included. In medieval garments reconstructed, information about the assembly is mostly limited to general info in the first few chapters. Costume close-up mostly points out notable details, such as raw edges or piecing. I've seen a lot of grief given to Janet Arnold's patterns for their lack of information, but compared to other books, her diagram notes are practically encyclopedic. The more familiar you are with garment construction, whether historical or contemporary, the easier it will be to decode the inconsistent labeling and drawings of these patterns and be able to fill in the blanks when necessary. Because each book is just a little bit different, there is no one set of guidelines to help, but there's some general tips you can follow. Use reference photos whenever you can. If the book is insufficient for this, many of the garments have been photographed and displayed by the museums where they are housed. Remember that these are descriptive notes rather than instructive ones. The authors are explaining how the garment was made. If the pattern isn't specific, then you can fill in the blanks. Try to find freedom rather than paralyzing fear in that fact. You can do it your way. If worse comes to worst, search for a tutorial on the parts of the assembly that are confusing you. If you can't figure out how a collar was attached, look up a general lesson on attaching collars. The skills are more transferable than I think you'd imagine. If you still can't quite figure it out, then make a tiny version. Some people can look at a 2D drawing and understand the three-dimensional object it represents. Others, not so much. A good way of figuring it out is to try and recreate the pattern in miniature. In the introduction to Patterns of Fashion, Janet Arnold shows how to create a quarter-scale mannequin for this purpose. I don't even go that far. I trace the pieces directly from the book as is. If you do own a quarter-scale mannequin and that's your preferred method, frankly, I don't know why you're still listening to me. So grab your go-to tracing material. If you don't own rolls of tissue paper already, you can start saving the tissue paper that comes in shoeboxes, deliveries, and gifts. I highly recommend having a tissue paper stash. Trace the pieces as they are on the page and cut them out with a tiny bit of seam allowance. Now try to assemble the miniature garment with the information you have as well as you can. You probably don't have a 1 8 scale mannequin hanging about, but it's useful to have the pattern stand up to get a better look at it, so I recommend a glass bottle for this purpose. If you still can't figure out the assembly of this garment, and no shame, some of these are wacky, then it's time to opt for Franken patterning and draping. Before we continue, I want to thank my Patreon supporters. This bodice pattern is part of an ongoing project to make a full Edwardian outfit. Along with some videos on the channel, I will also be posting shorter vlog-style updates on the progress of my outfit for my Patreon patrons. If you'd like to see these videos, you can sign up to become a patron at the link below, 
or in the card above. Thank you to all my current patrons who have been literally paying to keep the lights on while I took a break to help with a family health issue. Now back to our flowchart. If you have figured out the pattern assembly, congratulations. Ask yourself, will the scaled up pattern fit me? If yes, please proceed. If definitely not, then off to Franken patterning or draping with you. If you don't know how to figure it out, let me show you. Taking the pattern measurements. First things first, any 2D scaled down representation of a full scale 3D object is going to be a little bit off, but it will be close enough to answer the question. Confirm whether the pattern includes seam allowances. It's rare, but definitely worth checking. You do not need all measurements. Measuring the chest and waist is probably sufficient, and those are measurements you likely already know. If those measurements match, other adjustments will probably be minimal. Figure out how many bodice pieces there will be and if any of the pieces overlap. The bodice itself is drapey and overlaps in parts, but the bodice is a fitted shape, so it will give us an idea of the waist size without too much math. On average, the narrowest point of a bodice pattern will be the waistline. If it isn't marked, it will probably be evident by looking. In this pattern, for example, Ms. Arnold has marked the waistline with this dotted line. The notes do not say what it is, but it is the narrowest point and in the place you'd expect it to be. The pattern has three pieces that span from the center front to the center back, so we double the measurement to get the full waist, and then multiply that number by the pattern scale. So 1.5 inches times 2 is 3 inches times 8, which will be 24 inches, which is the full waist measurement. There's a similar way that you can find the chest measurement. It will usually be the broadest part of a fitted bodice, and it will be roughly level with the arm size. This is a quick reminder that I'm comparing the measurements against my corseted self, not my natural measurements. I will not usually scale up a gridded pattern if its measurements are smaller than my own by more than three or so inches. This isn't a hard and fast rule, it's just my comfort zone for alterations. Which brings me to my next question. Do you have a working knowledge of alterations or pattern grading? Some quick vocabulary clarification. Grading is not the same as scaling, which is not the same as alterations. Scaling increases the size uniformly across every axis, but people don't change at the same rate for height as for circumference. Changing a whole pattern for different sizes is called grading. Changing a pattern in small ways for an individual is alteration. If you don't have any of these skills, I recommend learning with simpler patterns. If you do have these skills, then congratulations! You can scale up a gridded pattern worry-free. If not, head to Franken patterning or draping. Now that I've sent most of you to the Franken patterning and draping category, let's talk about what those actually mean. I am still new to draping, so these will be a few general tips. I recommend following the link in the description if you need a proper tutorial. Basically, the goal is to recreate the pieces from the gridded pattern directly onto a mannequin. Your mannequin should be as close as possible to your measurements. If your mannequin isn't the same shape as you, there's no point. My biggest personal pro tip for draping is that the fabric will sit on you in whatever way it sits draped on the mannequin. Wrinkles or puckering will not go away on their own. The whole point of doing this is that it will work for your body, so don't worry if the pieces end up looking a little different. If they recreate the right garment shape, you are golden. You do not have to drape every single layer and piece of the garment. Sometimes you can just get a base layer draped and go from there. By comparing the bolero, bodice, and underbodice of this pattern, I can see that they follow very similar lines along the top edge. So I will drape the underbodice pieces and then use them to draft the other pieces later on. Franken patterning basically does what it says on the tin. It's combining parts of different sewing patterns to create a custom garment. This is a great way of getting a customized sewing pattern if you haven't learned how to draft patterns or how to make major alterations. It requires some alteration knowledge, but much less. I personally have not had great success with drafting my own sleeves, so I used Franken patterning. I found a narrow sleeve shape from a pattern in my size and traced it. I also traced the corresponding arm's eye onto a template. I transferred that shape onto my bodice pattern so that the sleeve would fit exactly. This takes a bit of a knack and it doesn't always work perfectly. However, if, like me, you have patterns that you just don't know what to do with but can't bear to let go of, 
This is a great way to make them useful. For pieces that rely on pleating, gathering, or ruffling, we're going to use math. Don't be scared. On the gridded pattern, the sleeve ruffle is x times longer than the sleeve circumference. So the length of my ruffle will be the same ratio, x times longer than my sleeve circumference. So here is the pattern I drafted for the bodice, using Franken patterning and draping. No scaling up required. In 1868, a London magazine wrote, Give a boy a hammer and chisel, show him how to use them. At once he begins to hack the doorposts, to take off the corners of shutters and window frames, until you teach him a better use for them, and how to keep his activity within bounds. Over time, this sentiment became the aphorism, If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So here's the thing about gridded patterns drafted from extant garments. They're not instructions. They are observations on how this specific garment was made. It's retrospective and observational. It's a tool to build on existing knowledge and experience. Even if you are using them to make garments, they are meant to be one source of many. If you are using gridded patterns as your only source, you're bound to be frustrated and probably not end up with what you're looking for. Expand your knowledge. Learn from more than one source. And for heaven's sakes, do not waste any more time on a pattern if it's not going to work for you. But what if scaling up is the right choice for you? Or you want to ignore everything I've said and follow your own precious chaotic heart? I've got a video coming very soon that will explore as many methods as possible for scaling up gridded patterns. I so hope this video has been helpful. If you'd like to have this flowchart for your personal use, it is available as a downloadable PDF and image file on my website and as a public post on my Patreon page. Follow the link in the description. Have you ever made anything from a gridded pattern? Let me know what your experience was like in the comments below. I'd love to hear everyone's stories. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and I'll see you soon.